Welcome back to the continuing saga of the PDP 1104 and 34. What I'm going to try and do now, that the power system is sorted, is uh, try and get some activity out of this console, which needs the console interface card, the M7859, installed in one of these slots here. It, it was installed in the fourth slot, so that's where I put it, and it connects via this little cable to the console and uh, there's a test procedure I found which enables you to do some checking of the unibus and, and it should be enough to see activity on the console without the CPU you just need this almost so getting to the console we've got the controller in slot 4 you always have to have a terminator at the end of the unibus so this one has to go into row 9, AB, or AB row 9. And if I had a CPU and memory, I could put them in there and I might have a minimal system. May need a bootloader card, I'm not sure about that. But apparently it's possible to test the console without the CPU or memory, just with this thing and a Terminator card. But, without the CPU apparently, according to the test I've got here, and I'll put a link to that below, you also need another Terminator card in the first Unibus slot. And because I've got two of these machines, I happen to have two of these Terminator cards. So, he goes in there. Alright, what will happen? Let's see. Power has been applied, I haven't turned DC on yet, but the transformer is buzzing. And here's the test procedure. Prerequisites, Unibus backplane connected to the power supply, check. Two bus terminators, check. M7859, check. Console board, yep, and the ribbon cable, good. Connect backplane to power supply, remove all cards from backplane, plug in M9302 or other terminators in both ends of, in both ends of the bus. Place that there. Du, 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 du. Power on. Power on. Dun, 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 dun. Ooh. Stop. Press control and one to go into maintenance mode. Control one. The easiest thing to change was this M7859. I'm using now the one from the 1134. There's no option jumpers or anything on it, so I presume they're identical. And that one should work as well as that one. So applying power again. Same stuff. What could be wrong? I'll try all the same stuff using the 1134. Right, I've installed those same cards into the 34 this time. And we'll try the same trick. Power on. Transformer buzz. DC on. Noisy fan, of course, but We've got the same signals. Okay, back to the drawing board, have a little think. Now there is a known error in the documentation about how you orient this cable. And I thought, yeah, yeah. All I have to do is um, make sure that pin one goes to pin one. Uh, and uh, if it's wrong, then apparently all these lights come on if you've got it round the wrong way. It doesn't really damage, you just reverse it. So I've been looking at the documentation and here it is all screwed up. In fact, the pin numbers on this connector go to the wrong... Pin 1 on here really should go to pin 20 on, on this end. So you don't join pin 1 to pin 1, you join pin 1 to pin 20. So I have now reversed it as they say to do and we'll see what happens this time. All right, turn on. Ah, 
got run and bus error, apparently that is normal. So, let's do the, uh, the trick. Press control and one. Mate, yep, good. On the maintenance mode, then press five to exit maintenance mode. Good. Console now is now a standalone unibus master. Right. So then enter something in the switch register. For example, one, two, three, four, five, six. Press LSR. SR disk comes on. Do not press clear, just enter the Unibus address of the Swiss register, which is 777-570. Then load address. Then press exam. And you should see one, two, three, four, five, six. But that's looking good. Yeah, that's just with the normal Terminator card. So, control one, put us in maintenance mode. Five, now we're in Unibus master mode. Try the one, two, three, four, five, six. Press LSR. So now we're looking at the switch register display. Into the Unibus address of the mask of the switch register. One, two, three, five, seven, zero. Load address. Press exam. And there we get it. Well, it works without the terminator in the first slot. This is a bit of a sick looking terminator. It's pretty dirty and corroded, but I've cleaned it up as much as I can. I think I'll just try what I just did then with only this one instead. Okay, power on. That to that. Control 1, maintenance mode. 5 to get out. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Switch register. Ding. Triple seven five seven zero one two three five seven zero. Load address. Then examine. Ooh. I didn't like typing the right number. Let's try that again. One two three four five six. <coughs> Load switch register. One two three. Five seven zero. Load address. Examine. No. That's something sus, isn't it? Looks like there might be something wrong with that other Terminator card. It's got a stuck bit. That should be a two. The poor bit's stuck on. Shouldn't be too hard to find. I might just try it on the uh, 34 as well. Just make sure everything works there too. Off. Well, 34 works, so let's try the 04 now. All right, same as that one. Control 1. Control 1, not doing anything. Why? So, to summarise, this is the 1104 chassis and power supply and they're the boards out of it the console the terminator and the console control all the parts here are from the 1134 that's the console control the terminator at the back there and the console here and okay Control 1, puts us in maintenance mode, 
five excellent maintenance mode that makes the this thing the uh, console control the bus master and we can type in a number one two three four five six load switch register switch register display so that's what we're looking at now put in an address of the switch register 777 570 load the address and now examine that address and we read out the data so we put in the address of the switch register examine then read out the data in that address which is what we entered before so this one is working and I suspect that these three are all no good the ones out of the 1104 but uh, it's time to go through and check out what's wrong so I'll just do exactly what I did then but with this instead keeping those guys in there hmm gone completely bad now that digit all right and he's losing a segment something dodgy there isn't it? now these things are oh, look at that. okay I was thinking it might be a bad segment in one of the displays but we can get them all to show so it looks like just dodgy connections these, these things are socketed so I should be able to just uh, clean up the pins on all of them hopefully but the keyboards the keypad's still not working so something wrong there have to get the oscilloscope onto that but okay that's good I'm glad it's not a, a bad digit because it's going to be harder to replace than say some chip all right let's get the pro out so it works with this console from the 1134 this is the 04 power supply and chassis uh, and the two boards in there the M7859 and the Control interface that goes to this cable and the M9302 terminator card, they're both from the 34 as well. And that all works, but swapping just one part out, this console, it doesn't work. So the problem can't be from there back, it's got to be in here. I made a block diagram. This system here that the display and the keypad talk over this cable by multiplexing there's six reference signals which provide the scanning of columns on the keyboard and digits in the display of these six lines only one of them can be on at a time and, it, and must rotate through them in a, in a sequence and in repeat uh, so it's effectively turning on one digit at a, at a time and in synchronism with that presumably the three bit code to say what numeral should be displayed for that digit should be presented at the same time as that digit is activated and then when the next digit is activated the code is changed etc around and around and around meanwhile while all that's going on it can be watch the controller processor on the M7859 can be looking at these four lines which if one of those goes active it knows that a key was pressed and it knows which of the four keys in the column was pressed because it knows which column it's currently activating with these scan lines so they're, they're, they are crucial to this front panel working so I'm going to have a look at those signals there see if I can see anything on them so it's turning on the oscilloscope Let me get this diagram those six scan drive multiplex scan drives come in here go to pull up resistors and then into buffers one of the buffers is for the keypad and one for the uh, display but we should see these signals here on and the easiest place to look for them is on those resistors those six signals three of them are these are on these resistors over here and three down here are the other three power back on Good. And good. And these 
these signals are active low. So yeah, that, that's one sixth of the cycle for that particular line, and then the next one will be along a little bit, ding, 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 until we've done all six, and then it repeats. Anyway, that's it. That, that looks as, as you'd expect. So let's see where that signal, let's see if it's getting to the keypad. Right, we're just looking at those six. They go through some buffers into the keypad. So we should see similar to those signals all over the show. They should be, if that's what we were just looking at, those signals there, and we're looking at the ends of the resistors. They go into buffers for the digits, which go up to these transistor drivers and they go to buffers for the keypad these signals um, so no we shouldn't see anything at the keypad but we should see signals on these chips or better still maybe I should just look at these two find these two chips which, yeah, these two chips here which are just both um, X inverters. Right, there's one input to one of the inverters, and its output should be the opposite. So that inverter is working. Next one, I'll go through and check them all. Five of the six inverters there are good, but then that's for the keypad. Uh, it only needs five five lines. One of them's not used. Six are used for the display, but five for the keypad. So we've got these six were all images of these because they weren't being inverted and these five were inverses of these because they were being inverted. Okay, so they should be getting to the keypad. So for the keypad, those five signals that we saw being inverted from the incoming scan multiplex scan signals the five that, that come up here go to these four lots of five lots of four NAND gates and the outputs of those go to these resistors here so we should have a look at those resistors which are the outputs going back to, back out here should have a look at those while pressing keys and we should see some activity. Okay, these four pull-up resistors here appear to be this bunch over here. So let's have a look at those guys. And the outputs on these are pretty ugly because even with no keys pressed pressing any button doesn't do anything there I was getting nowhere with it so now I'm scoping on channel 1 on the first of those incoming multiplex drives and if you look at the others on channel 2 if we look at the same one, there it is, and then do the other touch. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's a quiet spot. If no key is pressed, then the outputs are always low, but in between the signal, one of those signals going low, there's a glitch going high on the keypad, so that's why it's so ugly. And it's the same on all four of them. But if I press a key, we should get a high in one of those periods. Look at these 
look at the keys themselves, which should have eyes. And then my, ah, there yeah, might have something here. That should be ground, well it is. Now yeah, that's high, because it's being pulled up. But any key should, whichever key this is, should go to ground when I press it. I'm not sure that the ground wire looks like it's broke. Yeah, I think that ground wire is broken. Seems too loose. So none of these keys is going low. So what I'm looking at is this business here. All the keys go to ground and they're pulled up by a 10k resistor before they go into the gates we were looking at the and we were looking at the outputs just before. None of these were going high when a key was pressed. I suspect that the ground connection is broken so that these things are always pulled up. And this first pin here on the ribbon cable looks broken. Now maybe I busted that when I was trying to do this repair for a broken key, but yeah, no, it's definitely broken. Yeah. So, if I just use the probe to short it out, do we get anything? Ah. We do, we get some behaviour. Right, we've got a bad ground. I'll fix that up. Yeah, the problem is that this ground wire here is broken there where it enters the PCB. So it's pretty ugly. This is all very stiff and maybe more are gonna break soon. I guess the real answer would be to replace that whole a little bit of flat ribbon and it's the uh, circuit board appears to be sort of clipped in or glue the, these lips melted so that it holds the thing in but there's a bit of a bow in there I'm not sure why that is at the top that bow so I'm going to try and slip this through there connect it to the ground at each end and see how that goes but maybe it'll come to having to replace this whole damn ribbon cable at some stage. So here's my little bodge. There, going through that bow in the frame. Going out, coming out and connecting to the ground there. So I'll bolt this back down again and see how we go. There's the console back in place for the O4. Uh, oh, just by the way, I've replaced swapped out this mess for just a simple ribbon cable with one right angle fold in it. Even if the connectors were around the right way so you didn't have to, well this one in here is plugged in in reverse but even if that was the case you'd only have to insert an extra twist and there's plenty of room down there to do it so I don't know why they didn't do it. I don't think that will interfere with the boards above. In any case, it's still also easy to just plug it through there if you have to. But uh, yeah, I don't know why that's so long. Maybe for an extender card. But if you put this on, you put that on an extender card. But if if you were going to do that, then you just pull out your extender cable instead of having that there all the time. All right. So let's see if it still works. Something rubbing against the fan. I still have to make a, put my wadding in, into this to make a filter which goes behind there so that will stop that. Right, cleared whatever the interference was. Uh, I think I'm going to have to take it off again and uh, hit the, I didn't think I had to, so it's come good now. Dodgy connections from those displays in their sockets. They're, they're a bit loose and uh, the pins are a bit corroded, so I might have to hit them with some CRC to clean the corrosion off. But anyway, let's do the classic test. Control one, put it in maintenance mode. Oh, that didn't happen, did it? Control one, maintenance mode. Five to put it in bus boss mode. One, two, three, four, five, six. A little trip register. Bing. And then one, two, three, 
This is still using the M7859 board from the 1134 uh, and the M9302 Terminator board. These two guys. Now I'll just verify that there was a problem with using the M302 from the that originally came to this box. I think there was, there was a bad bit or something on it, but let's check that. Right, I've reinstalled the original M9302. This was the one from the 1134, which is nice and clean. The one that came with this box has got quite a bit of corrosion on it, so I'm expecting some dodgy joint in there. But let's see what the fault was again, or if indeed there was one. So power on. And control one. No. Ah, that should be a two. That was the problem. Okay, I'll start that again. Clear. Control. One. This is in maintenance mode. Five. Exits and push in bus boss mode. One, two, three, four, five, six. That should be a two in that position. Load the switch register. Then select the switch register's address. One, two, three, four, five, six. Load address and press examine and we get a 6 instead of a 2 there. But I bet if we put in uh, 44444, load switch register, the 1 goes away, the, the, the 4 goes away because this top digit should only ever be 0 or 1, so 4 wasn't valid for a 16 bit machine. That's cool, but that the 4 is stuck there, so let's go back to. 777-570, load address, examine, and 4. So it's happy when it should be a 4, but when it shouldn't, if we put in 0, 0, 0, 0, and then load address, we should have a stuck 4. Yeah. So that bus board has a, a bit stuck, data bit. So, I'll have a look at that board and see if I can spot something dodgy. We've got a problem with when we use the switch register on the console and console interface combination. We store data in there and read it back. We find that one of the bits is stuck on. This, this digit here of the 6 shows a 4 when it should be a 0. Now, I'm used to hexadecimal, not octal, so I mistakenly thought that that 4 was controlled by the third bit from the left, but it's, it's actually the second, bit 14. And you might think, well, hang on, this, the, the switch register is on this board, and the addressing logic which selects the address and reads from it is all on this board, so why does it go to the unibus? To, to read from the switch register and I guess it's it must do because this the switch register is the only data location that's on this board everything else is either in memory the CPU or an IO device so it shouldn't surprise us that the terminator card which is on the unibus will will affect accessing that location even though it's really on that board and not not it goes to the unibus anyway to read it and it's also, we've found that it works fine with this Terminator card and we get this problem with this Terminator card and it's not surprising that we do with that one because look at the corrosion on it. This is one that obviously suffered bird ship damage and um, it's the worst of anything out of the O4 so it's sort of nice that it, it's, most of it happened right here and not throughout. So. Let's uh, try and locate the fault on this board, because it must be on this board. It works with that one, it doesn't work with this one. And bit 14, data bit 14, if we look at the 
schematic for the Terminator card, which is just a bunch of resistor pairs from ground to 5 volts, uh, except for a couple of the AC low and DC low have capacitors in parallel with capacitor uh, resistor. Everything else is a resistor 178 ohms from 5 volts to the signal, and then 383 down to ground. And the one we're interested in, bit 14, is D14, which is on contact finger AL1. And using the deck alphabet, that would be, this is A, and 1 is the component side. Now we're just going to find L, which is A, B, C, D, E, F, no G, H, no I, J, K, L, that one there. And so, I thought, well, I should be able to measure a difference in resistance between that finger and ground compared to all the others. So let's look at the resistance. There's ground there. And if we look at, typically, we get 123 ohms. Next one. Dirty thing, isn't it? About 123. 123. 123. 123. And this is the faulty one. Open circuit. One after that. 123-ish. So that one is faulty. And as I was searching to think, as I was wondering how much this corrosion is going to affect trying to probe it, I thought, well, I'll just try here. 123. And so now we're just looking over this one centimetre. And it's open circuit. Open circuit open circuit. Now we're only talking a couple of millimetres of its open circuit. So there's a break in there. Holding up to the light, I can't see it. But there's... Actually, I can... Yeah, I can feel it. Yeah, I can feel it. There's a break there. Um, so, I think I'll give this a bit of a scrub with steel wool. See if I can... If, if the break becomes a bit more obvious. Uh, and ultimately just solder over it and check that all the others produce 123 ohms like they should. Now that corroded solder is quite hard to to join onto. The corrosion is hard to solder through to and I was perhaps a bit enthusiastic and broke away the track there so I had to jump her from the finger around to where that trace goes, which is there, which is also pretty hard to solder, but I managed to solder it. A uh, little bit of collateral damage there, but it was a break in the track there. And I've hot snotted that bodge wire down and sprayed the lock with, um, where is it, PCB lacquer anyway, which comes off easily. Hopefully that'll just protect the rest of it from any further corrosion. It's all been washed in vinegar, in water, in isopropyl alcohol, uh, yeah, it should be pretty clean. Um, and I've checked all the pins, well just check, because I've got lacquer on there now I have to use these ones here as a ground. Either side of that we've got 123, the one that we fixed, 123, and one the other side of it. 123-ish, yeah, 120 something. And as a double check of no uh, cross shorts, if we look between any two, we get, we look between two of these terminations, we get 240 ohms, next two, next two, next two which includes the one that's just been fixed and the next two which still includes the one that's just been fixed so no cross shorts either so I'm pretty happy that that uh, now is viable 
let's plug it in and try our little switch register test on the console and see if we lost that stuck bit. Radio, trying the test again. So, control one to get into maintenance mode, five to put it in bus boss mode, then type in one, two, three, four, five, six, store that in the switch register, in. Now, go to the address of the switch register, 777-570, load that address. And when we press examine, we should read out the one, two, three, four, five, six we got before, and that should be a two, not a six that stuck bit should be gone. Yay! Good shit. So, what's next? Uh, this, well, there's this board here. It didn't work, so let's plug it in place of that one to see if there's still any troubles. And, uh, of course, that's the most complex of the things. The console is fairly simple. The Terminator board is dead simple. Uh, but this is going to be hard to fix. If there's a, or it could potentially be hard to fix, but we have the advantage of a, a known working one to compare against. So I'll plug this in and see what happens. Just before trying it, this is I've got them mixed up now, haven't I? Now that's a good one. This is the suspect one. Notice this one's got two extra chips. There's a gap there and there's not here. Uh, and the engineering drawings have have these two chips shown. I haven't investigated what other differences there are or what the meaning of those two are. Uh, but yeah, just something worth keeping in mind. Okay, with the other board installed. Not well. It's been one of the key presses, almost if there's random garbage on them. Alright, let's have a closer look with the Pro. So here's the M7859 board that's causing problems. The maintenance manual for the KY11-LB, which is the combination of this and the front panel, uh, has a troubleshooting section. It's not very extensive. Uh, it gives a few basics to check which seem to be centering around this microprocessor here and so let's get, just go through what they suggest to look at which is check for minus 9 volts on pin 1 so, so power up I'll use that as a ground pin 1 minus 8.7 a touch low but probably good enough the manual actually says 9 volts but it's minus 9 which comes from the minus 15 volt supply via these two Zener diodes here right uh, the next thing to check is for 1 megahertz clock on that test point there so Okay, uh, looking at the, we'll check the 9 volts is on pin 1 of the microprocessor. Now it's, the manual says to look at the test point there, test point 1, and there should be a 1 megahertz clock signal, which we've got, we're looking at test point 1, which is just next to the processor there. We've got 1 megahertz clock signal, or thereabouts, 978 kilohertz. Uh, don't like the ring, that could just be my crappy probe. So one megahertz, and then it says to check uh, pins 15 and 16 for a non-overlapping pulses aligned with those guys, so 18, 17, 16. That looks pretty good, and then there's an opposite phase on the next pin, also good. Oh, and, and also check uh, pin 1 for, sorry, pin 18, should be low, let's hinder up pin to the microprocessor, 
and low. Okay, now what I want to do is check the scan codes, the scan signals coming out of there that drive the display and the keypad because that's what seems to be playing up. And they're on E72, which is. So we've had a problem with the console on the PDP 1104, which is fixed. There was a broken wire on the keypad. And this Terminator card, the M9302 down there, that also had a fault, which was a hairline crack in a trace. And the third part from the 1104 that is faulty so far, <laughs> every part has been faulty so far, uh, is this M7859 console interface board, which connects to the front panel via that cable. Now that, with 75 odd chips on it, is uh, going to be pretty hard to find faults in. We've got the engineering print set, which is a huge help, of course. Uh, a bit hard to follow around, but and it's a bit hard to see at a glance what's going on. But in the maintenance manual, there's a couple of block diagrams to work from. What are they? Yeah. Gives a bit more of an overview. Two different block diagrams and uh, I didn't, they, they're just not helpful to me. Um, they're not detailed enough. Like I'm trying to find out what's going wrong with this display. I know the signals coming into this display are no good but I need a bit more information now. It tells me where to look on the print on the print sets, but I thought, well, I'll spend a bit of time, about a day and a half, and working not from these but from the actual schematics, coming up with a similar diagram to that. I've got this, which shows in detail all the data paths and the control signals that enable data to get from one part to another. So everything is there. It's good enough to start working with, and now I know I want to look at these nine signals which drive the display, and they come from this register, and I'm seeing gibberish on those, and that could be because gibberish is being sent to it because the processor is screwing up, or perhaps uh, the signals that enable the data to get onto that bus are being turned on at the wrong time so that not the right data is being presented to the display. Uh, we shall see, but obviously that's going to be a bit, a bit hard to check with just an oscilloscope. So I've also spent a bit of time with making a logic analyzer. Actually, I had um, I bought one of these little things a while ago on eBay and just never did anything with it, just had it sitting there. Uh, and there's some software you can, for, you can use with logic analyzers called Pulse View. And there it is there. 16 channels can be displayed. And it works with this. Bit of trouble loading drivers, but once that's sorted, um, it's working now. This isn't actually a logic, logic analyzer, but it can be used as such. Uh, it's a development board for a Cypress processor. It brings all the pins out, and you can use 16 of them as inputs. And it's able to sample them at a at high speed and send it down USB at a pretty good rate. Um, certainly fast enough to analyze this sort of old deck equipment anyway. may not be good for modern stuff but it's just fine for this gear. But the inputs on that have no protection, so I spent a bit of time making this board, which has resistors and xenodiodes protecting the inputs, send them to buffer ICs, which then send it to here. And also the outputs of the buffers go to LEDs. So a good bit of a visual indication what's going on too. So, And I had to, this thing needs five volts, which doesn't come out on any of those pins, so I've 
just added a header on the voltage regulator there so I can select either 5 volts or 3.3 and this plugs in here the selected voltage goes into there and we have a bunch of cheap and nasty probes which can connect to these so uh, I'll set this up and let's start analysing some logic. I don't want to verify <clears throat> the six signals coming out there, so I want to get onto this chip here, these buffers, page 13, which is here, these outputs. Now, <clears throat> that's this chip right in here. I can't get to this side of it easily with these clips. So we're at about three quarters of an hour now and uh, thanks for sticking with me for this long. I'll spare you the ensuing hours of mucking about with schematics, block diagrams and the logic analyzer. That approach was doomed to failure. I was getting inconsistent and ambiguous results. And I've decided to lost cause trying to work out what that little microprocessor is trying to do and then what parts on that board are stopping it do it. Involved too much guesswork of something so complex and dynamic and really needed a more rigorous approach and a deeper understanding of the system. By the way, I did swap the 8008 microprocessor between the two boards uh, as it's the only easily interchangeable part and thankfully both parts are good, both microprocessors are good. So going forward it's become obvious I need to switch to extremely clever mode to fix this board and that's what I've done. Since recording this I've put a lot of effort into an alternative method of repair and I'm positive it will produce a good result. I'm quite proud of it, how well it works and uh, I'll present it to you in the next part two of this video. Until then I hope you enjoyed this at least partial repair. Please give it a thumbs up if you did and, and subscribe to see the new approach in the next part. Don't forget to hit the bell to get notifications. Um, catch you later.